thought that this would be good a place as any to show how they took the scripture and brought in paganism to the messianic belief. They applied already pagan icons and images to scriptures and those that didn't accept their idolatry were the ones fed to the lions, persecuted and killed. Let's look at a few scriptures and symbols. Try to keep in mind how this works as applied to other symbols and gods. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In the pagan world, these images are what is known as the good shepherd. This is Hermes and Orpheus. The Encyclopedia of Catholicism tells us the painting of the Good Shepherd in the catacomb of the Jordani. Note that Yahushua is depicted as if he were either Apollo or Orpheus, following the earlier Greco-Roman models. This is a partial truth because this is a picture of Apollo or Orpheus. The next day, John sees Yahushua coming to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of Yah which taketh away the sins of the world. And looking upon Yehoshua as he walked, he says, Behold, the Lamb of Yah. This is the symbol for Agnes Die. In Christian tradition, the host, the Lamb of Yah, the figure of a lamb as emblematic of Christ as the light of the world, counterpart of Hindu Agni. And they had few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. And he says to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Sometimes we are given a story of how those persecuted for their faith drew one half of a fish and another believer would draw the other to identify one believer to another. My question is, what then? Are we to believe people are being snatched up and killed and someone is standing around with a half of fish drawn near them waiting for someone to come up and finish the other half? I don't think so. Let's get started. Labrum or Cairo is an abbreviation of Creston, a good thing or a good omen, and was used in Greece to mark an important passage. The labrum was also an emblem of the Chaldean sky god. In Christianity, it was adopted as the Cairo, the first two letters of Christ. It was the emblem of Constantine, said to have been revealed to him in a dream. It was placed on his standard and on the shields of his soldiers, thus putting them under the protection of Christ. It is frequently depicted with the Alpha and Omega symbols on lamps, vessels, and tombs. The Chaldean God of Life was sometimes entitled Aya, and sometimes Aeus. The name Aeus is probably connected with Aeus, the Sanskrit for life, and also with Eos, Greek name for the dawn. Chaos, the infinite space, whence gods, men, and all things else arose, and which existed according to ancient cosmogonies, previous to the creation of the universe, may be resolved into Ak, Aeus, the light, spirit, or essence of the great A. The Chaldean Aeus was known alternatively as Hoa, and it would seem that in its dual aspect, the Holy One came to be known somewhat indiscriminatingly as Oa. Aeus or Aya. The Assyrians called the right testicle Anu or On, which produced male seed, and the left testicle Hoa or Hia, which produced female seed. Thus, the male genitals, with Asher as the penis, formed the male trinity. This is the staff of Osiris also, and his monogram, and was adopted by the Christians as a sign. 
one of the Gnostic terms for the Supreme Spirit was Iaeus, the ever-existent Aeus, and Tiaeus, a Chinese name for the Supreme Spirit, may be resolved in Taeus, the resplendent Aeus. Aeus, also known as Aya or Oannes, God of Light. Some say that Aeus is the Greek rendering of the god Ea. To identify Nimrod with Oannes, mentioned by Barossus as appearing out of the sea, it will be remembered that Nimrod has been proven to be Bacchus. Then for proof that Nimrod or Bacchus, on being overcome by his enemies, was fabled to have taken refuge in the sea. When therefore he was represented as reappearing, it was natural that he should reappear in the very character of Oannes, as a fish god. Now Jerome calls Dagon the well-known fish Piscium Meroris, the fish of sorrow, which goes far to identify that fish god with Bacchus, the lamented one, and the identification is complete when Ezekiel tells us that some call Bacchus Ictus, or the fish. Let's recap, the Labrum Cairo, emblem of the Chaldean sky god. The Chaldeans had a god of life, Aeos. It seems the Chaldean Aeos, in his dual aspect, came to be known as Aeus. The Cairo was depicted with an Alpha and Omega. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Gnostic term for the Supreme Spirit was Aeus the ever-existent Aeus. Aeus was also known as Oannes, same as Ea, same as Dagon, the same as Bacchus, the same as Nimrod, who was also known as Saturn, just one of his many names. Abram resolves into Lay Bar Um, Everlasting Father Son. The first two letters of the name Christ. In Greek, this cross was adopted by Roman Emperor Constantine of ancient origin. It was previously the symbol of Kronos, the Greek god of time. However, the symbol was in use long before Christianity, and X probably stood for great fire or sun, and P probably stood for Pater or Pata. But again, this emblem had a pagan origin and were found as inscriptions on rock dating from the year 2500 BCE, being interpreted as a combination of two sun symbols, the P as the axe or hammer, symbol of the sun or sky deity, and the cross or the X as an ancient symbol of the sun both of these signs having a sensual or fertility meaning as well. Another proof of its pagan origin is the identical found on a coin of Ptolemus III from year 247 to 222 BCE. The letter P, as understood by mystics, the pastoral staff or shepherd's crook, stands for Pa, parent or father, shepherd of all souls, zodiacal correspondence, Capricorn. This letter P symbol also seems to be connected to the rod and ring. It is thought to depict a pair of measuring instruments, a rule and a tape, taken as symbolic of divine justice, a particular association with the god Samas. Sometimes, however, the rod and ring appear to be a staff and a chaplet of beads. In the Assyrian and Egyptian systems, a scourge-bearing god is a very common figure on the monuments, 
and though the scourge is an attribute of the Egyptian god Shem, it is specially associated with Osiris, the savior, judge, and avenger, who also carries the shepherd's crook, or crozier. A figure of Osiris reverenced as Krestos, the benign god, which sufficed to set up among the Christus as erewhile among the pagans, the demand for an explanation, and probably one would have been forthcoming without the story as to Apollonius. Crook, divine leadership, staff of the celestial shepherd, Egyptian symbol of power and sovereignty, emblem of Anubis, Kanum, Kanosu, Osiris, Sokar, Crozier, ornamented pastoral staff, born before or by an archbishop or bishop on ceremonial occasions in the Christian church. Sometimes terminates in a cross or a sculptured scene of the crucifixion or a pendant veil is attached. Symbolizes authority, bishop of all souls, jurisdiction, watchfulness. Identical with the phallus, which early Etruscan augurs consulted. Compare the crook or litanus. Lituus, a twisted wand used by augurs for purposes of divination. Something like a bishop's crozier. In art frequently depicted in the form of a spiral. Axis, phallus. The universal axis is variously conceived as an axle tree, a backbone, fiery column, nail, pal, pike, pillar, pole, pole star, rod, spear, spike, spindle, spine, staff, tree trunk, torso. Since it is said the Cairo represents the first two letters in the name of Christ, this would be a good place to go into the name. The Hebrew word Mashiach means anointed of Yah. It is applied to priests and kings throughout scripture. Notice how they tried to hide the name of the Father. Hebrew is read from right to left. The two letters in blue, Yod, Hey, make the sound Yah. Now looking at the Hebrew characters in blue of Mashiach, we see the Yod, Hey, or the name Yah, would be the correct pronunciation, Mashiach. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. We see here that Messiah is the English translation of the Hebrew Mashiach. He first finds his own brother Simon and says to him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. In reading this scripture, we find that the translators are replacing the Hebrew word Mashiach for Christ. The odd thing is, there is a Greek translation for the Hebrew word Mashiach. Greek 33:23, Messiahs. To answer the question, why Christ and not Messiah, let's look to the occult to find the answer. The word Christos existed ages before Christianity was heard of. It is found used from the 5th century BC by Herodotus, by Aeschylus, and other classical Greek writers, the meaning of it being applied to both things and persons. The instrumentality, agency, or medium by which a god was supposed to speak or make known his will, the mouthpiece of the deity, the place or seat of such instrumentality, at which divine utterances were believed to be given. A response, decision, or message given usually by a priest or priestess of a god. Thus in Aeschylus, we read of Pythocresta, the oracles delivered by a Pythian god through a Pythonus, and Pythocrestos in the nominative singular of an adjective derived from Cairo. Pagan classics express more than one idea by the verb Kairomai consulting an oracle, for it also means fated, doomed by an oracle in the sense of a sacrificial victim to its decree, or to the word. Crusteroin is not only the seed of an oracle, but also an offering to or for the oracle. Crestus is one who expounds or explains oracles, a prophet or soothsayer, and Crestoros is one who belongs to or is in service of an oracle, a god, or a master. 
All this is evidence that the terms Christ and Christians, spelled originally crest and Christians, were directly borrowed from the temple terminology of the pagans and meant the same thing. The God of the Jews was now substituted for the oracle and other gods. Crestos became a noun applied to one special person, and new terms such as Crestinoi and Crestodulus, a follower or servant of Crestos. Philo Judaeus, the monotheist, assuredly, using already the same term for monotheistic purposes, for he speaks of Theocresta, God declared, or one who is declared by God, and of Logia Theocresta, saying delivered by God, which proves that he wrote at a time between the first century BC and the first AD, when neither Christians nor Christians were yet known under these names, but still called themselves the Nazarenes. The notable difference between the two words, Cairo, consulting or obtaining response from a god or oracle, and Creo, to rub, to anoint, has not prevented the ecclesiastical adoption and coinage from Philo's expression, Theocrustos, to that other term, Theochristos, anointed by God. Thus, the quiet substitution for the letter I for E for dogmatic purposes was achieved in the easiest way as we now see. But in the esoteric phraseology of the temples, Crestos, a word which like the participle Crestius, is formed under the same rule and conveys the same sense from the verb Chiromai, answers to what we would call an adept, also a Hykele, a disciple. It is in this sense that it is used by Euripides and by Aeschylus. This qualification was applied to those whom the god, oracle, or any superior had proclaimed this, that, or anything else. What is now the evidence for the real significance given to the two terms Crestos and Christos by the ancients in the pre-Christian ages? For the latter had no object to achieve, therefore nothing to conceal or disfigure, and their evidence is naturally the more reliable of the two. This evidence can be obtained by first studying the meaning given to these words by the classics, and then their correct significance search for in mystic symbology. Tertullian denounces in the third chapter of his Apologia the word Christianus as derived by crafty interpretation. Dr. Jones, on the other hand, letting out the information corroborated by good sources that Christos was the name given to Christ by the Gnostics and even by unbelievers, assures us that the real name ought to be Christos, thus repeating and supporting the original pious fraud of the early fathers, a fraud which led to the carnalization of the whole Christian system. There is still another and far more weighty proof that the name Christos is pre-Christian. The evidence for it is found in the prophecy of the Eurythrian Sibyl. We read it in Asus Christos Theohuis Soter Staros. Read esoterically, this string of meaningless detached nouns, which has no sense to the profane, contains a real prophecy only not referring to Jesus and a verse from the mystic catechism of the initiate. Read esoterically, the words Asus Christos Theo Uis Soter Staros, meaning literally Asus Christos, God, Son, Savior, Cross, are most excellent handles to hang a Christian prophecy on, but they are pagan, not Christian. If called upon to explain the names Asus Christos, the answer is study mythology, the so-called fictions of the ancients, and they will give you the key. Ponder over Apollo, the solar god and the healer, and the allegory about his son, Giannis, or Ion, his priest Adelphus, through whom alone could prayers reach the immortal gods, and his other son, Asclepius, called the Soter, or Savior. Here is a leaflet from Esoteric History, written in symbolic phraseology by the old Grecian poets. The city of Crissa was built in memory of Cressa, 
daughter of King Erechthus and mother of Yanis by Apollo, in memory of the danger which Yanis escaped. We learn that Yanis abandoned by his mother in a grotto to hide the shame of the virgin who bore a son, was found by Hermes, who brought the infant to Delphi, nurtured him by his father's sanctuary and oracle, where under the name of Cressus, Yanis became first a Crestus, a priest, soothsayer, or initiate, and then very, very nearly a Crestoral, a sacrificial victim. The mother built the city of Crissa. Crissa is akin to cross. Such is the allegory and it symbolizes simply the trials of initiation. Finding then that Giannis, the solar god and the son of Apollo, the sun, means the initiator and the opener of the gate of light or secret wisdom of the mysteries, that he is born from Crissa and that he was a Crestos through whom spoke the god. Aesculapius was the divine physician, the healer, the savior, as he was called, a title also given to Giannis of Delphi. And Yeso, the daughter of Aesculapius, was the goddess of healing, under whose patronage were all the candidates for initiation in her father's temple, the novices, or Crestoi, called the sons of Yeso. Now, if we remember, firstly, that the names of Iasis in their different forms, such as Iasus, Aesian, Jason, and Iasis were very common in ancient Greece, especially among the descendants of Jesus. As also the number of the sons of Yeso, the Mistoi, and future initiates, why should not the enigmatic words in the sibling book be read in their legitimate light, one that had not to do with the Christian prophecy? The secret doctrine teaches that the first two words, Asus Crestos, mean simply son of Yeso, a Crestos, or servant of the oracle god. Indeed, Yeso, in its Ionic dialect Aso, and the expression Aeusis in its archaic form, simply mean the son of Yeso, the healer. Leaving aside, in this case, the mystical signification of the now famous sibling sentence, and given its literal interpretation only, on the authority of all that has been said, the mysterious words would stand. Asus, Christos, Theo, Huis, Soter, Staros, translates to Jesus, Christos, God, Son, Savior, Cross. Esoterically translated, Son of Yeso Christos, Son of Apollo, the Savior from the Cross. Truly, Christianity can never hope to be understood until every trace of dogmatism is swept away from it and the dead letter sacrificed to the eternal spirit of truth, which is Horus, which is Krishna, which is Buddha, as much as it is the Gnostic Christos and the true Christ of Paul. What Madame Blavatsky told us about the name Jesus, or Jesus, or Iusus, is very similar to what we read in the explanatory notes in the Scriptures Version Bible. Consider Iusus, rendered as Jesus in English versions up to now. For example, the authoritative Greek English lexicon of Lydell and Scott under Iaso, the Greek goddess of healing, reveals that the name Iaso is Aiso in the Ionic dialect of the Greeks, Iusus being the contracted genitive form. In David Kravitz's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Mythology, we found a similar form, namely Iasus. There were four different Greek deities with the name of Iasus, one of them being the son of Rhea. Further, it is well known that Aeus is the abbreviated form of the name Iusus, and Dr. Bullinger in the Apocalypse, page 396, says Aeus was part of the name of Bacchus. Also see Come Out of Her My People by C.J. Coster. By now we know that the Greeks were pagans. They had many gods like Apollo, Poseidon, Aphrodite, and Zeus. What the Greek translators did was Hellenize the Bible.
What you are about to see are the scanned pages from my 1611 King James Bible, which is the first King James Bible published. You will not see the name Jesus in this Bible version because there was no letter J at the time of this translation. What we do see here in the book of Luke chapter four, verse 27, is that they added the God Zeus as one of the prophets. 